what I want us to understand from Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9 is that these chapters make it perfectly clear that there are parts of the Old Testament that are done away in Christ. I mean, in these two chapters, we see that that, that which is old uh, wax is ready to vanish. Wax is, that which is old is ready to vanish away. He's talking about the Old Testament, the carnal ordinances, and he starts to talk specifically about what those things are. And it's important that we pay uh, attention to what those specific things are, because a lot of people today um, they want to pretend like the entire Old Testament has just been done away in Christ, and that's just not the case. It's very specific about the things that Christ has done away with. <clears throat> it says there in, uh, in, in chapter 8, verse 7, it tells us that if the Old Testament had been faultless, in verse 7, then should no place have been sought for the second. So the Old Testament, the, 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 the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the priesthood, all of that, if that had been perfect, if that had been faultless, then there would have been no need for Christ to come and offer himself a sacrifice for sins. In verse 13 it says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth, waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So he's saying when there's a new testament that's come, the first is made old, right? Now nine ten tells us, chapter 9 verse 10 tells us that they were imposed until the time of Reformation. Now the time of Reformation is when Christ came and offered himself a sacrifice for sins. And those things done away, that he put away, those things that wax old, those things that were not perfect, those things that had not, that were not that were fault that were had uh, had uh, were not faultless, that had to had to be replaced with the second. What were those things? Those things done away are the tabernacle, the meats, the drinks, the diverse washings, the carnal ordinances. Now again, we don't want to confuse carnal ordinances with the moral law of God. Those are two different things. Amen. The carnal ordinances are the things like, you know, the peace offerings and the sin offerings and all of these are the carnal ordinances. Those are not the, the, the civil or moral law that God instituted in the books of Moses. <clears throat> so it's important we don't confuse those two things. And one of those ordinances that I want to focus in tonight, one of those things that has, that has done away in Christ is worshiping on the Sabbath day. Worshiping on the Sabbath day. And the title of the sermon could simply be uh, Why We Worship on the First Day of the Week. Why do we worship on the first day of the week? Amen. Now, obviously, this isn't a struggle for you guys because it's the first day of the week and we're all in church, right? <laughs> but it's important to understand this because there are people that, that not only in this doctrine of when we ought to worship, but in other doctrines, they want to come in and bring us into bondage and to teach us, and basically what they are is they're called Judaizers. They want to bring us back into the carnal ordinances. They want to teach us that we have to worship on the Sabbath day. They want to tell us that you know there are certain things that, that we need to observe from the Old Testament as far as uh, you know the Sabbath would be the one that we're going to focus on. And those people are called Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm really not going to get into their doctrine, but the fact is that they do teach that, they, that we ought to worship on the Sabbath day. That's why they worship on Saturday. That's why they meet, rather than on Sunday, they go and meet on Saturday. Now go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. The Bible is very clear here, not only in Hebrews, but in other places, that there are certain things that are done away in Christ, the carnal ordinances. And the one we're going to look at tonight and see it be done away in the New Testament and see the new example that has been set for us that we are to worship on the first day of the week is when we ought to come together as a church for preaching and prayer and worship. <clears throat> that, that's what we're going to focus in on. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now that's a great verse, you know, side note for soul winning. Colossians 2, 13. It says, How many sins did Jesus Christ die for? All of them. Because it says he has forgiven you all trespasses. Amen. You know, big ones, little ones. So that's just kind of a side note. Amen. Verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he, had, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then it goes on and says this in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or the new moon, 
or of the Sabbath days. He's saying you're not to be judged in these things, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. All those things were things that were pointing to Christ. There was a, they were the, we could see them uh, back then. They saw them as a shadow. They couldn't see Christ, but now we see Christ. We see the body which cast that shadow. Therefore, we no longer look at the shadow of the, the, those things. We look at the body. We look at Christ himself, the head. And it says, because of that, we are to let no man judge us in respect of Sabbath days. Right? There's several things listed there, right? That's why we're allowed, you know, also there it says, let no man judge you therefore in meat. Praise God, right? We can eat the bacon. You know, and if you like seafood, you can eat the seafood. You can go out and get the sea rat, and you can go out and get the cockroach of the sea. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, that's lobster and shrimp, okay? Well, they're just, I like to call them that because that makes them a little less appetizing. But. It says that, or in drink, or in spread of a holy day, you know, or new moon, or of the Sabbath days, right? There's Sabbath days in the Bible, days where no work was to be done, where people would have come together to worship God. We are not to be judged in those things. Why is it we're not to be judged by those things? Well, it's because it was blotted out, is what this chapter says. It says it was blotted out, that it was taken out of the way, that it was nailed to his cross. I mean, that's some strong language that he's using here to try to get this through to these people and saying, look, this has been nailed to the cross of Christ. Amen. Now let me tell you, as Jesus Christ nails something to his cross, I just suggest we leave it there. Amen. You know, if he went to the length to say, you know what, I'm putting this out of the way, I'm nailing this to my cross, you know, I'm not one who wants to take it back down and say, oh, no, no, we're keeping this. No, it's been nailed to his cross. Amen. He's the one who took it out of the way. Further, he triumphed over those things it says. He triumphed over them, such as the Sabbath day. I mean, were we going to get up there and say, actually, Jesus didn't triumph over those things? Say, oh, he came in second? You know, no, the Bible says he triumphed over those things. And he talks about the fact that one of those things is the Sabbath. And of course, that's a, re that's a reference, the triumphing, the making a show of them openly, was a reference to his resurrection. That's how he triumphed over them. So why is it that we worship on the first day? Well, it's because that's the day that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Amen. I mean, I don't need a better reason, do you? I mean, the, most, the, I mean, the pinnacle moment of history. I mean, all of civilization's calendar is, is, is built around that moment when Christ rose from the dead. That, that's an amazing thing. That's why we worship on the first day. Yeah. That's a pretty good reason to why we ought to gather together on the first day, because that's the day that Jesus Christ chose to arise. Uh, uh, um, to, to be resurrected from the grave. <clears throat> Go and turn over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We worship on the first day because that is the day Christ arose from the dead. <clears throat> the Bible says, you're going to John 20, it says in Luke 24, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. That makes it very clear that it was on the first day of the week. They didn't say the day after the Sabbath. I mean, we would, we would figure that out, right? But he wanted us to know it was the first day of the week. Look at John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. That's why we worship on the first day. Because of verses like this. Amen. We worship on the first day because that is the Lord's day. Go ahead and put a bookmark in John chapter 20 and turn over to Re uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Where, the, where, where we see the first day being referred to as the Lord's day. I mean, He laid claim to it. He nailed these things to the cross. He triumphed over them. And then He claimed the day of the week and they called it His day. The Lord's day. Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse 10. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard a voice, and behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So who, who when I say the Lord's day, well, who are we referring to when we say the Lord's day? Well, it gives a description here. Going on, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, which thou seest write in a book, and send it unto seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed the garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girl. 
His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the, the sound of many waters. You know, if a guy like that lays claim to a day, I'm not going to argue with him. I mean, that's a fearful sight. John says, you know, he fell at his feet as one dead. So, if that's, if that's the day he wants to call his day, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to let him have it. I'm not going to argue with the Lord about which day is his and which day isn't. You know, he chose to rise on the first day, he, and he's God, and we ought to just, that ought to be enough for us. Now, not only because it's the day that Jesus Christ arose, and, and not only is it because we, uh, we see that God is the one who claimed that day as his own, uh, do we worship on the first day? But we also worship on the first day of the week because that is the New Testament practice. Because that is the pattern that we see set forth throughout the New Testament. I mean, just over and over and over again, you see the first day being mentioned. Go ahead and turn over to, uh, again, keep something in John 20, but turn to Mark 16. Mark 16. We worship on the first day because that is the day Christ arose from the dead. We worship on the first day because that, the, uh, <clears throat> that is the New Testament practice that we see. That is the example of the early Christian church that we see. Jesus showed himself to his disciples on the first day, the day he arose from the grave. The day he arose, he chose himself to the disciples. You see that in Mark 16, verse 9. Mark 16, verse 9, where the Bible reads, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went out and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither they believed they them. Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and abraded them with their unbelief and hardness of, uh, and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had uh, had seen him after he was risen. So when Jesus, you know, uh, is resurrected, he shows himself to his disciples. He shows himself. To, to uh, Mary Magdalene, and he shows them to the two that were uh, on their way to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, and then he shows up and abrades the eleven for their hardness of heart. It says that you're in John, say in John, go ahead and say in John 20, but it says in Luke 24, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, and they walked together all, and they talked together of all these things that had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So Jesus, on the very first day, the day that he's resurrected, is showing himself. Beginning to show first to one, and then to two, and then to the rest. Now you're in John chapter 20, look at verse 19. John 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, I mean, he just keeps mentioning it, the first day, the first day, the first day. God wants us to know when this happened. It was on the first day. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were, disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the, uh, in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now, this is something I've been wanting to preach on a little while and what really inspired this sermon is that I got, uh, I, I replied to a guy who left a voicemail and, and, his, and I, I learned really quick that there is such a thing as professional time wasters. <laughs> as as Pat, uh, Brother Segura has, has preached previously, if you ever heard that sermon, yeah. PTWs, these are real people that are out there. They just want to get your ear and just fill it with nonsense. And one of the first, and you want to talk about why why aren't we worshiping on the Sabbath day and this and that? And, and he told me how and he told me how he went to his own pastor at his church and argued with him about it. And I'm thinking, good night. If you're arguing with your pastor, like what what is some guy a thousand miles away going to do for you over the phone, hmm. right? And I just quoted, I just said, well, you know, the Bible says that they gathered together the first day of the week, and that's when Jesus showed himself. That's one reason. And he says, yeah, but it says they were gathered together because of the fear of the Jews. And right then, I'm just like, I'm immediately just trying to get off the phone with the guy, because I realize what I've, what, I've, what, I've, uh, what I've done to myself. So I don't even bother. I'm just like, yeah, 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 well, you know, watch these sermons, and I get off the phone as quick as I can. Because the guy, I mean, he just didn't, he already had his mind made up from everything that I had talked to him about on the phone. And he says, well, they had gathered for the fear of the Jews. That's why they were there. Now, that's not what this is saying. That's not why they were gathered there. They were gathered there because the Lord had just died, you know, three days earlier. That, you know, he had, they just saw the Lord 
that they've been following for years, be, you know, tortured and crucified, and they're mourning and they're weeping and they're distraught and they're perplexed and they don't understand. You know, and it's not like that happened. They just went, oh, oh well, back to their normal life. It's not like Peter and John just said, well, I guess that was a fluke and decided to get, go back to fishing. I mean, their hearts were smote. They, the, you know, the, 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 the flock was scattered. And they're trying to pick up the pieces and understand what's going on. But of course they're going to come together. I mean, when you lose somebody that's dear and close to you, that's a time to surround yourself with people. That's the time to be with family and friends and mourn and weep, you know, and to, and to get comfort. So that's why they were gathered together. Now, why it says there that, uh, um, that the, uh, the doors were shut when the disciples were assembled together for the fears of the Jews. That's why the doors were shut. It's because of the fear of the Jews. They weren't assembled together for the fear of the Jews. That's why they shut the doors when they got together for the fear of the Jews. You see that? This guy's trying to say, well, the only reason they got together on the first day of the week was for the fear of the Jews. This is a ridiculous argument. It's a stupid objection. I don't know why I have to explain it to you guys, but if you ever run across it, or if you ever get some harebrained idea, you know, you need to understand that passage right there. The reason that the doors were shut was because of the fear of the Jews. They were gathered because of the news of Jesus' body having gone missing. I mean, Mary Magdalene shows up and is like, hey, I went to the sepulcher and the body's gone. I mean, you, aren't, aren't you going to hop on? If something like that happens, you're going you're gonna to be reaching out. You're going to get on Facebook. You're going to you know, call people. You're going to be texting. And people are going to be getting together, right? You're going to want to know, this is something to talk about. We need to get together and figure this out. <clears throat> now, regardless of all that, regardless of why you think the doors are shut or weren't shut, the fact is, it was this moment when they were all gathered together in one place, being the first day of the week, that Jesus appears to the apostles. That was the moment he decided to show up. That was when he decided, hey, you know what? Now I'm going to show myself to my disciples. It was when they were gathered together being the first day of the week. He could have waited the next day. He could have waited the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day. He could have waited a whole week if he wanted to. But he, wait, he didn't wait. He did it on the first day of the week. Now, that is the pattern that we see from here on out. That's the first time we see them gathered together on the first day of the week when Jesus decides to show himself unto them, I believe, to set a pattern that that, that was what we are to, that is why we are to gather on the, on the first day of the week. We see them gathering on the first day of the week throughout the rest of the New Testament. <clears throat> For example, um, I'll have you turn over to uh, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And when you get to Acts, put a bookmark there. Put a bookmark there. We're done in John, I believe. It shouldn't speak too soon. But yeah, just once you get to Acts, we're going to be in Acts for a little bit, because this is where we see a lot of it, is in Acts. So keep something in Acts. Now you're turning to Acts 20, I'll remind you in Acts 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with the cord in one place, right? And that was when the Holy Ghost came upon them, and in the, in the of uh, in the flame of fire, like a cloven tongue of fire, rest upon them. There was the, the sound of the mighty wind rushing you recall the story? And uh, <clears throat> I don't really have the time to develop that point, but if you were to go back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy 16, or Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16, Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16 clearly teach that the day of Pentecost takes place the day after the Sabbath, which would be the first day of the week. So the very first example in Acts where we see them gathered together on place in the day of Pentecost is a day is a Sabbath day that took place on the first day of the week. Okay, and again, if you want to look that up and study that out. That's Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. Not only that, but we see that Paul preached to the church in Troas on the first day of the week. You're there in uh, Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. Verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, they were coming together, not because Paul was there, but because it was the first day of the week. Paul had already been there for several days. So they come together on the, on the first day of the week. <clears throat> Paul preached unto them. I mean, if Paul's in town, on church, when you're having church, you better believe he's the one that's going to be preaching, right? I mean, there's a guest preacher in town. I, I, I don't know who was preaching there normally, but I'm sure he was more than glad to step aside and say, Pulpit's yours, Paul. 
And Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, there you go. That was definitely a Baptist preacher, wasn't it? <laughs> and we know it was a Baptist service because a guy fell asleep and fell out of the window, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it was Acts chapter 20 is where we see Paul was preaching to them on the first day of the week. When was that? When they were when the apostles or well, when the uh, when they when the disciples were gathered together to break bread. Okay, so you keep something in Acts. Turn over to First Corinthians chapter sixteen. We're going to see another example of early Christians, of those that uh, in the very beginning of the church were gathering together on the first day of the week, and that's why we today worship on the first day of the week. We saw it in Acts two on the day of Pentecost, a holiday that took place on the first day of the week. We see Paul preaching to the disciples of Troas on the first day of the week. Now in 1 Corinthians 16, we see where they were to gather money for the poor in Jerusalem on the first day of the week. If you recall, there was that, uh, there was that drought in Jerusalem. There was a drought or a famine in Jerusalem that was prophesied by, I believe it was Agabus, in the book of Acts. And then Paul starts to say uh, elsewhere that, you know, that that the, the saints of Jerusalem, they ought to reap of your carnal things, saying you guys get, you know, you, he was uh, imploring churches to give of their, their substance, their, 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 uh, their money, in order to support the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. And you find that in 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, he's talking about the saints which are in Jerusalem. As I have given order into, to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul's writing ahead of, he's writing and sending this letter ahead of himself, saying, look, I'm making my way to Jerusalem. I, the, the, the saints of Jerusalem are poor. They're going through affliction. They need help financially. I've already told the people in Galatia to lay, start laying money aside and to build as every man purposes in his own heart, as, every, as God prospers every man, to lay that money aside so that when I get there, we're not going to take up an offering. The money's going to be ready to go. Because he wanted to get that money to these people as quick as he could. They were they needed help. So he's saying, look, that there be no gatherings when I come. When you guys are gathered together, I want you to lay money aside and, and begin a collection for these saints. And when was that? Up on the first day of the week. Paul wanted the money to be ready. He, didn't want, he did not, not gather once he got there. And the Corinthians were to lay it up in store the first day of the week. <clears throat> Another great example, and this is something I heard recently that I, I don't know why I never thought of this, but this is, I think, a really good case or a really good um, reason why we, uh, uh, or argument that we can make for worshiping on the first day of the week. You know, those that would say, well, you should, you should, work on, you should worship on Saturday. You should, you, know, you should observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? I mean, you know, as if we don't have enough examples here, but consider this, that Paul was never in church on Saturday. You never see Paul in church on Saturday. Where do you see Paul on the Sabbaths? Where do you see him on the last day of the week on the Sabbaths throughout it? You always see him preaching where? In the synagogue. He's always going to the Jews in the synagogues, right? Which, you know, if you go and read Revelation 3, verse 11, and Revelation 2, verse 11, where God calls that place the synagogue of Satan, where the, the where, you know the, the blasphemy of the Jews, that, that lie, the, you know, that's where that's going on. So that's not the church. That's that is the synagogue. It's very distinct from the church. The synagogue of Satan and the church of God are two very distinct things. But where do you see Paul on Sabbath days? You don't see him in church. You see him over and over and over again in the synagogue. Go ahead and turn to Acts thirteen. Acts thirteen. It says in Acts 13, beginning at verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men, uh, ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Jump down to verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, so of course Paul preaches to them, preaches Christ to them. And when the, Paul, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. 
They say, hey, we want you to come back in here next week and do it again. We want to hear some more preaching about Christ. Now, Paul wasn't there holding a worship service. Paul wasn't there preaching to the saved. He was there preaching Christ to the Jews, to the unsaved. In verse 44, the next day, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God. I mean, talk about some effective soul winning. I mean, what an exciting time. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. So we see right here, Paul going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, I'll begin reading in verse 13, Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day he went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and he sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul, and she was baptized in her household. <clears throat> and she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house, and there abide. And she constrained us. So Paul, again, on the Sabbath day, is going down to the riverside to preach to these, these, uh, these ladies that were wont to, to be there and to make prayer. <clears throat> Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We'll see again, just over and over again. Paul, you know, if he, if, if we're to observe uh, the, the, the day, to, if the day to come together and worship God is a Sabbath day, it, Paul's really messing up. Paul's not sounding a very good example. Because every time we see Paul in the book of Acts, he's going to the synagogue and preaching the gospel. He's going down to the bank on the riverside and preaching to Lydia and the women that gathered there to, to pray. <clears throat> Look at Acts 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphilius and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Right? This is a church. And Paul, as his manner was, this is something he did often. Hey, where's the local synagogue? You know, it's the Sabbath. I got to go preach to these heathens. Right? He'd go out and preach to these unsaved Jews. As his manner was, he went into them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So, we don't preach the gospel in church. We don't, you know, I mean, I, mean, I know a lot of churches do. That's all they preach ever. You know, what the church is there for the, for the edification of the body, for the, for the perfecting of the saints. Yeah. So we all come to the, the knowledge of a perfect man in Christ that we do rooted up and built, in, built up in Him. Amen. That's what church is for. It's for the believer. Amen. It's not to preach to God, bring the unsaved. and We go out to the unsaved and preach to them. That's the biblical model. And that's why you see Paul on the Sabbath day going out and preaching Christ unto the Jews. Right? Because that was, that was his day for soul winning. That was the day he went out and, and did some soul winning. <laughs> Look at Acts 18. Acts 18. Acts 18 and verse 1. The Bible reads, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. <clears throat> now Paul was in the synagogue every Sabbath day preaching Christ. Now does that mean that Paul was not in church the rest of the time? No, Paul was still going to church. If we if we know the story here, Paul was in um, in Corinth for for a year and six months. The Bible says, and that while he was there, he's preaching in the synagogue on every Sabbath day, but he was also meeting in church on, on the first day. I absolutely believe that. Because we know that there was a church that was there. See, Paul was in Corinth for over a year. So of course he's going to be in church. Of course he's I mean, do we know that if what do we know whether or not there was a church in Corinth? Yeah, we know there was a church in Corinth, right? Because we have first and second Corinthians where he's Paul where Paul writes and addresses the church that's there. Now, this is when he's setting that church up. This is when he's establishing that church, when he's there for a year and six months. 
So he's going into the Sabbath, or he's going to the synagogue on the Sabbath days, and then on the first day he's going and meeting with the church that is in Corinth. That's why it says there in verse 11 of Acts 18, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So no doubt we know Paul had established a church while he was there for that year and six months. <clears throat> and if you would, go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 16, look at verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord. Now, who was it that Paul met in Acts 18? Aquila and Priscilla, right? So he meets them there. They're tent makers. And it says that uh, Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So Paul goes to Corinth, meets Aquila and Priscilla. They establish a church in their house. He remains there for a year and a half preaching and teaching the Word of God to them and also going into the synagogue. So we have a perfect example here of Paul you know, doing a soul winning on Saturday, but going to church on Sunday, the first day of the week. Amen. Amen. You see, the churches were not meeting in synagogues. They were meeting in houses, which is a great, you know, there's nothing wrong with the church meeting in a house. You know, people have this crazy idea that a church has to have this standalone building with this giant parking lot, this big ornate structure, and it has to have the, you know, the, just to be this glorious temple. And that's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with the church meeting in some very humble and meager places such as a house and I would even submit unto you that there's nothing wrong with this church meeting in this humble and meager small office space Amen. right Amen. I mean we're still doing great works we're still going out we got somebody saved today Amen. we're still Amen. we're still uh, edifying the body we're still meeting together and we're growing and we're praying and we're seeing things done does it matter what building we're in no. it doesn't matter what building we're meeting in whether it's in a house or whether it's in an office complex or if it's in a retail space or even an industrial building it doesn't matter we can go out and we can have church in the middle of a field yeah you know we could go out and have church they probably wouldn't appreciate it but we could have it in smoky mills <laughs> right it doesn't matter where we meet you know and on that note let me just get this off my chest because i keep hearing about this it doesn't matter what the address is on Amen. our church <laughs> i keep hearing about people not that people that live in tucson that like Pastor Anderson's preaching and say, man, I'd love to go to a church like Faithful Word. <laughs> Faithful Word shows up in Tucson and starts a church. Well, I just, I don't like the address. Yep. <laughs> you know, people like that, if it's not the address, it's going to be something else. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be like, well, it's too tight. I don't like what color the chairs are. <laughs> you know, I, he doesn't shave. You know, I don't know what it is. You know, they can make, he wears red shirts. They'll, do, they'll come up with something. But the address... I mean, really, if that's what's keeping you out of church is the address. Yeah. Because, you know, in case anyone in the room doesn't know, our address is 2666. <laughs> is it, it's 2666. It's not 666. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you, I mean, if they're, if they're going to be true to this thing, they're going to have to go, like, every place that has the number 666 in it is just off, off limits. <laughs> Their favorite restaurant meets at, you know, 3460 you know 34666 I mean they're just getting you know what I mean it's like yeah. it's not 666 it's 2666 yeah. <laughs> I don't know I thought it was a joke at first I really did but brother Fabian told me about man there's people out there that are, are complaining about the address and I'm like but it's not 666 it's 2666 and then he actually bumps into a guy today who's like a faithful word listener but he actually he had he even told Fabian, well, I just don't appreciate that address. The address has got me freaked it freaked me out. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. I don't know. Anyway, I got it off my chest. <laughs> if that if it's not if it's not that, it's gonna be something else. But our address is not six six six. It's twenty six sixty six. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on that, but oh yeah, because it doesn't matter where we meet as a church. Yeah. You know, we can meet in a house, we can meet here, we can meet anywhere. We see that example here, and, that, and that's where the early church was meeting, was in a house. And when were they meeting in that house? On the first day of the week. They weren't meeting on the Sabbath day in the synagogues. Go ahead and turn over to Colossians chapter 4. We'll see another example of this. 
Colossians chapter 4. I won't turn you to Colossians uh, 6, verse 66. <laughs> I think there is a 66 word. I won't take you to John 6, verse 66, because you know that a verse like that probably shouldn't be in the Bible. We never mind the fact that 666 is in the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, that's where you even know about. I don't know. It's, okay. I just can't believe you actually ran into it. I actually said that. Anyway. Colossians 4, look at verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. So that's where the early church was meeting. They were meeting in houses. They were meeting on the first day of the week. Now why does this matter? Like I said in the beginning, nobody in this room seems to be struggling with this doctrine. We're all here on the first day of the week. You know, I don't think anyone in this room anytime soon is going to show up on Saturday and knock on the door. Be like, that's the day I'm here from church. <laughs> you know, I was there yesterday, Brother Corbin. I don't know where you were. I was there on Saturday. Don't tell me I wasn't trying to get to church. I didn't see you there, you know. <clears throat> but the fact is, there are people that would want to bring us into bondage in this matter. The Seventh day Adventists, right? Yeah. They'll harp on this. But, you know, it even goes, it's just, it's just a, it's a warning against this general just danger that's out there. That there are people, not just in the, in the matter of the Sabbath, but they, they want to bring back, you know, like the Hebrew Roots Movement. You know, they want to start changing the name of Jesus and saying, we got to go back to the Torah. we got to start being Torah-observing Christians. Yeah. They're Judaizers. Is what they are. They're trying to bring us back into bondage over things which God has triumphed. Amen. Over, you know, they want to bring things back down off the cross that He nailed to it and do, has done away with, and they want to bring it back. They want to. They want to. They want to look at the shadow when the body of Christ is right here. Yeah. <clears throat> so we need to be careful not to let this mentality begin to develop in our minds and understand, you know, why we do the things we do. It's not at random. It's not just at chance. That we, it's not like the early church just picked a day out of the hat and said, "Ah, it's Sunday, the first day of the week, that'll work." Right? No. The reason they picked that day because that was the day the Lord arose from the dead. That was the day that the Lord showed Himself unto His disciples. And that's what we just see throughout the New Testament. They want to bring us into bondage in this matter. Turn over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We'll close out Luke chapter 6. You know, Christ came... They want to bring us into bondage in this matter of the Sabbath. This did not Christ. You know, and it was the... If you recall, it was the Old Testament Jews. Not the Old Testament Jews, but it was the Jews in the New Testament... This is one of the major criticisms of Jesus Christ is that He was doing things on the Sabbath. And that's because they didn't understand who they were dealing with. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 1, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that He went through the cornfield and His disciples plucked the corn, ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto Him, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did, when he himself was in hunger? And they that were with him, how he went into the house of God and to take and eat the showbread, and also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he saith unto him, The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. You know, he is the one that rules over the Sabbath. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the one who triumphed over it. You know, he said that, that, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You know, that these things have been done away in Christ. He's the Lord of it and He's put it aside. And now that's why we worship on the first day of the week. Let's go ahead and pray. Amen.